might start um, introducing our afternoon keynote, Matthew Sag. Now, you already have the formal bio, so I don't need to outline Matt's uh, magnificent achievements. Um, it is perhaps worth noting, however, um, just how well he fits in at this forum today. This is a man who, for one journal article, read over 280 fair use cases. And not just read the cases, but went and researched the lawyers and the surrounding circumstances of the case. Um, now, that is a man who is a copyright geek after my own heart, like many of you in this room. Um, but not just that. Um, he also has done a regression analysis of these cases. Um, in other words, he's also a bit of a maths geek, which makes him probably my new intellectual crush. So um, he has a lot to say to us as we go through a copyright law reform process this year. Um, as you can see, the question he's asking is one of the ones that is currently before the ALRC and has certainly been a matter of controversy. So without further ado, I'm going to let him say what he has to say to us. Matthew, thank you. Oh, well, Kim, thank you so much. And I just want to thank uh, the Australian Digital Alliance uh, and the National Library and everyone else involved with this event. It's so wonderful for me to be back here. I, uh, I grew up in Adelaide and Brisbane, but I went to university in Canberra and I worked here for two and a half years after I graduated. And so Canberra is you know, one of my homes. I have many homes now, uh, but I'm excited to be here. Um, so let's talk about copyright and uh, fair use. Um, there didn't used to be copyright law. This is something that we all should keep in mind. In the days of monasteries and scribes, there was no copyright law. There was just copying. Um, uh, copyright law came into being as a response to the disruptive new technology of Gutenberg's movable type printing press. And copyright has been responding to new technology ever since. Uh, in the digital age, uh, copyright law can be a little bit baffling. Uh, we live in a time where, online at least, experiencing, sharing, remixing, these all involve technical acts of reproduction and thus implicate copyright law. The interests of copyright owners and the developers of new technology and the public and citizens at large are often presented in conflict. And we've seen conflicts involving almost every new technology. The player piano, the gramophone. Uh, before they were the content owners, the recording industry were the pirates. The gramophone was seen as a fundamental challenge to sheet music, etc. Um, and now you, you can interpret these images for yourself. Um, uh, New technologies of reproduction and communication create new vehicles of expression. They create new communities of interest. They expose existing ambiguities and paradoxes within the law. And the internet is, of course, the ultimate technology of reproduction and communication. So one of the fundamental questions that Australian policymakers are grappling with at the moment is how should the law respond? For the past 300 years, the rights associated with copyright have become longer, they've become easier to get, and they've become broader in scope, generally. Copyright today is almost universally framed in terms of a very broad set of rights. You have, as the author, the right to reproduce the work. Um, the question for 2013 and beyond is how should exceptions and limitations to those rights be structured? Um, these questions are not just about whether one particular activity should or should not be legal for a particular purpose. They are questions 
not just about the content of exceptions and limitations, but also their structure. Fundamentally, they're questions about who decides these issues and when do they get decided. Um, one of the key issues that Australia is addressing at the moment, and many countries around the world are addressing, is should we rely on an open standard, such as the fair use doctrine, or should we trust in the legislative process to articulate a more tailored, more constrained, and allegedly more precise set of rule-based limitations and exceptions? Uh, my belief, based on my experience in the US and looking at experience around the world, is that the fair use doctrine has several advantages. Uh, it allows the law to develop in response to new technology, to things that could not have been foreseen or were not foreseen. Uh, the fair use also has a huge advantage in that decisions about permissible use actually track the reasons why we care about copyright. So you don't have cases being decided on random technological accident or questions just of ta taxonomy or language. You actually have to ask questions about, well, what is the market effect? What is the nature of this use? Uh, and they are fundamental questions that track the reasons why we have copyright as a society. Um, just to highlight the contrast, uh, fair use is important in a technological sense because it allows people developing new technologies of reproduction, which is now any new digital technology. It allows them to actually make an assessment of whether their use is fair, and then ultimately, if challenged, they will have to back up that assessment. Um, uh, but the alternative is a rule-based system where only those people with existing lobbying power uh, really have much of a chance of creating any new exception. Um, uh, in a fair use system, the legitimacy of new technology and new use is determined when it's challenged. Uh, in the Australian system currently, um, every new use, every new technology uh, is apparently forbidden until Parliament in its wisdom, gets around to saying otherwise. Well, Parliament in Australia is very busy. They have a number of issues on their agenda. And I just want to observe that Parliament getting around to making something legal has taken a really long time. You know, and for the past two months, I've played a little game where I find people who don't know much about copyright law, but think of themselves as quite intelligent, educated, and sophisticated, and I say, by the way, did you realise that using your VCR was illegal until 2006? And they go, what? And then usually expletives follow. Um, a law that just doesn't make any sense is not a law that asks to be taken that seriously. And we've heard about some of the problems and issues about whether copyright is being taken seriously here. Um, regardless of what flow on effects it has, I just think that the law should make sense, if the law can. Um, and you know, the Australian law clearly doesn't. Uh, you know, uh, internet search engines, mm, yeah, probably still illegal. Certainly the uh, ALRC in its comment paper suggests as much, and you know, that seems to be right. Um, so is there anything wrong with the fair use doctrine, now that I've explained some of its advantages? Well, one of the main criticisms that you will hear is, no, the fair use doctrine is too uncertain. It is random. Uh, I've heard it described as a lottery. Uh, the interesting thing about that assertion is that it's almost always made without any empirical justification. And as a description of the past 30 years of US case law, you know, the world's preeminent fair use jurisdiction, this is actually an empirical claim. And if we think of ourselves as scientists, you know what we should do when someone makes a claim about the world? We should test it. Now, there are limitations as to how you can test it, but it's at least worth a go. So uh, I'm going to spend 
a little while taking you through some of my research that actually is a project to try and test whether fair use is predictable. So I'm going to be explaining the data that I looked at, the way I approached the topic, the kind of hypotheses that I generated, and then I'm going to explain the results. Um, if you find some of the graphs a little hard to follow, you can actually find these slides on my website. Um, you can find this paper uh, on SSRN. Um, just put my name into Google, you'll figure it out. Um, so, uh, the prior literature. Well, there are lots and lots of claims. Uh, I think I stopped my footnote once I got to about 20, but I think there are literally hundreds of claims of people saying, in one form or another, fair use is really too uncertain. Um, uh, sometimes people point to something. They generally point to, well, here's a case where the district court held one thing, and then the Court of Appeals overturned it, and then the Supreme Court overturned that again. Doesn't that show it's chaotic? Well, of course, you know, that will happen in certain cases in any legal system. Um, so no, that doesn't really show that much. Uh, but the main argument you hear is just an intrinsic belief, really as a statement of faith, that any decision system based on standards must be uncertain, must be much more uncertain than a rule-based system. Um, uh, in 2008, Barton Beebe at uh, New York University Law School conducted an empirical analysis of the fair use case law. Uh, Barton's paper is a really important path-breaking exercise and it told us a lot about the doctrine that we did not actually know, but it was all within the judgment, assuming that the world as described by the judge is actually the real world, um, which is not always an assumption that one wants to make. Um, uh, Pamela Samuelson, who I believe spoke here last year at this forum, uh, uh, one of the legends of the Copyright Academy, uh, she sat down and she read all of the case law and has produced a wonderful paper showing the various doctrinal clusters that fair use falls into. And if you read that paper, it's quite easy to see that fair use has actually developed into a rational and sensible jurisprudence, uh, by and large, in the US. Um, my study is a little bit different. What I tried to do is focus on facts that are external to the judgment facts that litigants either did know or could have known prior to the litigation and to see whether the intuitions about how the doctrine should work are actually borne out in the cases. Um, so what's the data here? I just looked at district court cases. So in Australia, that would just be single federal court judgments, not full federal court judgments. I had just over 280 cases spanning about 30 years. Um, and just in case you're curious, the average win rate for the fair use defendant in those cases was uh, just under 40%. Um, so I derived various hypotheses from the Copyright Act, from uh, the case law, from legal and academic folk wisdom in order to create, before looking at the data, a set of testable hypotheses. You can't just do the data and reverse engineer the hypotheses. That's not how statistics works. Um, uh, in order to explain this, I just need to give you a little bit of an overview of the US fair use doctrine. Um, some of you will know this, and so I apologize. Some of you, this might all be a bit new. Uh, the US inherited its fair use doctrine from England. Uh, fair use is an English doctrine fundamentally. It starts with some of the very earliest copyright cases, all to do with the abridgment of books uh, back in the mid-1700s and then going forward. Uh, the US did not codify fair use until 1976. When it did, uh, this is what the Act looked like. And I've just shrunk all the words that are not important. So the Act says, uh, the fair use of a copyrighted work is not infringement, blah, blah, blah. Factors to be considered shall include. The first factor 
is essentially the purpose and character of the use. Uh, I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, the second character is the nature of the copyrighted work. The third factor is the amount and substantiality of the use. In other words, an inquiry into how much was copied. Now, the fourth factor relates to the effect on the market. Um, and it's not just the existing market, it's potential future markets as well. So, what are the basic theories that you would have about fair use? Well, uh, the number one theory that you would have based on reading the US cases is that the more transformative a use is, and I'll explain that in a moment, uh, the more likely it should be to be a fair use. Likewise, uh, there are many people who think that commerciality is important. So not being commercial should be a factor in favor of fair use. Uh, only being a partial copy as opposed to a complete copy should be predictive of fair use, um, if only because that's clearly a factor in the statute and it usually makes the market effect less. Um, and then we have this factor uh, of the market effect. Um, things that should make fair use less likely according to the case law are that the work was unpublished and that the work was creative. Uh, there's some indication in the case law that the more creative a work is, the less scope there might be for fair use. Um, uh, so now a brief explanation of how I actually created instruments to test these general intuitions. Transformative use is the hardest one because if I just subjectively read every case and said is transformative, is not transformative, there is no reason why you should accept my opinion over someone else's opinion. Um, uh, transformative use, we're told by the Supreme Court, lies actually at the heart of the fair use doctrine. Um, so what is transformative use? Well, I would like to explain this with reference to zombies, because um, I think this is the best vehicle for explaining most difficult legal concepts. Um, the key thing about a transformative use, as the court explains, is that it's use for a different purpose of character that alters the previous work with you know, new expression, new meaning, or new message. It's not just creating something different. So if Pride and Prejudice was still subject to copyright protection, and we wrote a sequel, such as Mr. Darcy Takes a Wife, Pride and Prejudice Continues, which you can buy on Amazon, uh, that would just be a sequel. It would not be a transformative use. It's not really a fundamental shift in purpose. It's fairly well settled copyright law that when George Lucas made Star Wars, he had the right to make The Empire Strikes Back, and you did not. On the other hand, a work that uses a lot of the same text, but is radically different, and actually makes fun of the original, such as Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which just intersperses a lot of zombie mayhem in with Pride and Prejudice, um, in a way that I think adds something to the story. Uh, that would clearly be transformative use. We have a radical shift in purpose. Um, you can call it satire, you can call it parody, you can choose whatever label you want. It's really fundamentally different. Uh, and that's what you're looking for for a transformative use. Again, a lot of those judgments are subjective. The only thing I thought you could reliably code for is whether there is a shift from being a creative work to an informational work. That, to me, seemed like something, if that is happening either in either direction, that must be a transformative use. So when I talk about transformative use and creative shift from now on, you have to recognize I'm only capturing a little bit of the concept of transformative use. Uh, but I think I'm capturing something that is utterly reliably and incontestably transformative. Um, commercial use. Commercial use is kind of a tough concept in the US case law um, because judge, some judges, when they decide that they want the defendant to lose, they say their activity is commercial. 
They don't actually mean it's commercial, they mean it had an effect on the market. Well, there's already a factor for that. Um, so, you know, when the Ninth Circuit said that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing of music is not fair use, they said, oh, it's commercial. Even though there's no money changing hands and people do it in their pajamas. Um, honestly, they didn't mean that. They were just bootstrapping. Uh, uh, I coded things as commercial and my research assistants coded them as commercial. Uh, if the plaintiff's work was used as part, literally as part of the defendant's commercial product or service, meaning something sold for money or obvious pecuniary gain. Uh, we said it was indirect commercial use if they were doing something for commercial gain, but you couldn't find the plaintiff's work there. The real problem with market effect is it's prone to complete circularity. And if you've read the submissions to the Law Reform Commission, you'll see some of that circularity on display. Um, it, you can spin the circle either way. Generally it goes, well, if we say it's not fair use, then you need our permission and so you need to pay us so there would be a market. On the other hand, if we just assume that it is fair use, then we don't need to pay you and there's no market because we don't need to pay you. Um, you know, both chains of reasoning utterly circular and unhelpful. Um, it's also a problem that even if you're looking for real you know, displacement, this is a fact that's highly contested. The parties always argue about this kind of thing. Uh, so in the end, the partial solution dealing with market effect was simply to look at how far away the parties were in terms of what their business was. We used the census codes uh, to define what the nature of the business was and we looked at how far away they were. Um, uh, and that's the sort of market separation concept. So market separation is only an indirect proxy for market effect, but it says you know, they're in a different market. Um, one final hypothesis we get from uh, uh, some authors who are extremely skeptical of fair use and the occasional judge is that fair use is a social subsidy. It's, it's a bit like welfare. Uh, and in the US when you say something's like welfare, that really means you should get rid of it. Um, uh, uh, it's interesting to think about whether fair use should just be reserved for the underdog or does just favor the underdog? Now the first is a normative question that I'm not gonna immediately get into, but the second is an empirical question. Does fair use actually favor the underdog? Um, we, you know, looking at the sociology literature, uh, we essentially implemented this a couple of ways. One is just Real people versus corporations. Real people can be assumed to be the underdog. That's pretty reliable. Um, we also looked up all of the attorneys in the paper-based Martindale-Hubble year-by-year index, which was excruciating. Um, and we looked at their experience ratings. Um, okay, that is my long explanation of all the measures. Uh, uh, now, uh, the fun part, I get to talk about the results. Uh, uh, here are the results as a really ugly table that I strongly urge you not to read. Um, but just uh, for anyone who has done a bit of statistics or remembers their stats, uh, you know, here are the variables. Here are some different regression models. Um, the important one is the model that actually includes all of the variables. Um, so I'm going to talk about these numbers but I'm going to talk about them in terms of a picture. Uh, uh, what this picture is, is it takes the regression coefficients uh, and it just graphs them. Um, anything in grey is not statistically significant. Uh, anything in red makes a finding of fair use less likely. Anything in Dark blue makes a finding of fair use more likely. I'm going to simplify this picture even further and pull out all the gray bars. This is what we are left with. Uh, transformative use as measured by creative shift really does seem to matter. It seems to be the most uh, 
maybe almost the most important thing in terms of predicting that fair use is more likely. Um, uh, direct commercial use uh, is something that really counts against you. But remember, direct commercial use, you take the plaintiff's work and you include it as part of a commercial product that you then sell to the public. Uh, what you don't see there is indirect commercial use. Um, don't know where that's gone. Oh, that's right. Indirect commercial use is... Indirect commercial use is what you get when you factor out commercial and direct commercial. Um, sorry. I guess I should have had a bar for that as well. Um, partial copy. Uh, the least surprising finding of all. Making less than 100% copy was more likely to make something fair use than copying the entirety of something. Um, uh, we found that having a weak plaintiff on one measure and having a weak defendant on the other measure really seemed to matter. So if you think that litigation is all about relative social power, then on one measure for each, we find that that's true. But we don't find it for the other measure. So it's an open question as to how strong that result is. Um, uh, what does all of this mean for our understanding of the fair use doctrine? Well, uh, I think there are, three, there, there are three myths I'd like to attack before I get into whether fair use is predictable or not, which I think is you know, the fourth myth. The first myth is that fair use is only available for non-commercial actors. People say that sometimes. Uh, plaintiffs say that sometimes, hopefully. Um, you know, there's no justification for that based on the case law, and nor is there any evidence of that in the data. Um, uh, the second myth refers to the special status of creative works and unpublished works. Uh, you just don't see that in the data. And in the paper, <coughs> Excuse me, I give some explanations as to why that would be. Um, and the third myth is, of course, that fair use factors the underdog. If anything, as in most of life, fair use favours the overdog. You know, people with better resources, better lawyers, more money. Uh, you know, like the, any litigation system, uh, that seems to be an advantage that tilts in their favour. Um, uh, but of course, the big thing here is the assertion that oh, fair use is just a lottery argument. It's just the right to hire a lawyer. Um, uh, it's unpredictable. Um, I don't think that it really is that unpredictable. And here's a way of explaining why that is. So the base rate for a finding of fair use, this is you know, just the average of all the cases, it's just under 40%. You know. um, uh, uh, the PC's messed with my fonts. Um, uh, if you know that it's a transformative creative shift case, then actually the you know, predicted rate of a finding of fair use is 62%. If you add the fact that it's also a partial copy, the prediction that it will be fair use rises even higher. And finally, if you add the fact, and here I just chose natural person plaintiff, that you know, the person who's suing you is not a corporation, they're a natural person, then actually the chances that you are going to win go up to around 87%. Now that is the ideal fair use case. You know, I've used it transformatively, I haven't used the whole thing, and the person suing me is just an individual. Um, and the reason why that matters is because having read all the cases, there are a lot of crazy plaintiffs and crazy defendants. Um, uh, yeah, which is, again, the same in any litigation system. Um, so, uh, some thoughts and observations I'd like to make in conclusion. You shouldn't expect, with a standard like fair use, that every expert and every lawyer will agree with every decision. There are some fair use decisions that I personally might make differently. Uh, there are some that I see as, you know, reasonable people could disagree. Um, but it's far from the case that fair use is unpredictable or random 
or a lottery. Uh, and what I want to tell you from my own experience is that American lawyers routinely advise clients about the fair use doctrine. Um, sometimes that advice is slightly hedged. It's not good practice as a lawyer to say, I give you a 100% guarantee that no matter what happens, that if this case goes to a jury, you will win, right? If any of you have hired lawyers and you've heard them say that, you come and tell me afterwards. Um, I'll, I will be amazed. Uh, the other thing that American lawyers do quite routinely is they say, mm, you're planning on doing that, and I can see a way where that might actually interfere with the interests of the copyright owner. Why don't we, why don't we just play it a little bit safe and change it so it works this way? That will make your argument stronger. Or in the case of it, you know, uh, I advised someone one day who wanted to respond to something that had been written they disagreed with, and they wanted to include the entire article they were responding to. I'm like, why don't you just pick out the bits that are really important and nicely encapsulate what you're objecting to? And then you're on solid ground. Reprinting the whole thing, it doesn't seem necessary. So when we ask whether something's predictable, we should be asking, is this a rational system of law that allows forward-looking actors to govern their lives, make investment decisions, and make a reasonable assessment of risk? Um, and I think on that basis, the fair use doctrine stacks up pretty well. The other thing I want to say is that not all certainty is desirable. The certainty is not desirable at any cost. Um, a copyright system without fair use uh, guarantees the certainty that new uses will only be approved once they become mainstream, or in Australia's case, a long time afterwards. Um, <laughs> the copyright owners will continue to try and regulate downstream uses regardless of the fairness of those uses. And I don't say that copyright owners should only get to sell their content once in one form under every circumstances. I have a lot of sympathy for that they might try and divide the market in some different ways. Um, but I do think that you know, if you sold someone a CD and you said, we're selling you the music, then you don't get the right to tell them, oh, you can't play it on your cool little new device. Um, that your technical act of format shifting, this music that we sold you and we said we were selling you, it's not actually yours anymore. We're taking it back. Um, I think that if copyright owners want to divide the market, then it's incumbent upon them to say, yeah, it's 20 bucks, but we're not selling you the music. We're giving you this really thin right that is probably not very useful in five years' time. You know, and if they do that honestly and transparently, that might be okay. Um, but their marketing people will never let them do that, so it's kind of moot. Um, uh, we also guarantee the certainty that test cases on new technology, and um, we saw this in the Optus TV Now case, um, you know, no criticism of the court here, it's the way the Australian legislation is at the moment, focuses on uh, the issues that are not the issues. The issue should have been, is Optus really taking unfair advantage here? Are they you know, destroying this separate market? Or are they just letting consumers do more conveniently something they had the right to do anyway? Uh, in America, that's the way the decision would have been decided. In Australia, we had to decide it with some nonsense about, oh, who really makes the copy? Yeah, the consumer presses the button, but it's jointly made, uh, which uh, I do not find convincing. Um, finally, uh, Honestly, we guarantee that the US will continue to be a better place to develop new technology that involves anything digital and particularly Web 2.0 businesses. And I don't think that's what any of you want. It's certainly not what I want. Um, so we need to be realistic about rules. You know, we didn't, you know, fair use will not be perfect, but our rules are far from perfect. Um, you know, in Australia, when we write rules, we can't predict the future. It turns out we can't even predict the past. Um, you know, there were technological developments in 2006 that we missed, even though they were there on the ground the last time we changed the law. Um, and uh, you know, the rules that we have, they're a regulatory uh, nightmare. Um, 
fair use, ultimately, it relies on intuitions of fairness. That is something people are much more comfortable with. Um, uh, so with that, I uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to taking your questions. Not being the selfish chair, I suppose I should open the floor first. Does anyone have any questions for Matt? Fiona. Yeah. Uh, I was interested in this is really interesting methodology that you oh, microphone's coming. Um, so this is one of the fundamental questions, uh, and I must admit, the first time I heard it, I was shocked because in the US, no one ever asked, well, we're worried there won't be enough litigation. Um, but, uh, you know, I understand when you're only a country of 20 million people or New Zealand's only a country of six, three, four, four million people, uh, that Actually, that's something you might want to think about. It doesn't take a lot of litigation to map out the contours. Um, when you have a doctrine that relies on fundamental questions of, is this for a really different purpose? And is this something that doesn't actually harm the interests of the copyright owner? Then a lot of the easy cases, are, they're pretty easy. And you know, people from both sides can see it. Now, inevitably, you will have some test case litigation. But guess what? You already have that test case litigation. Um, you just have it uh, along issues that are kind of silly, um, so, you know, if you look at the Optus <laughs> case. Sure. Well, I mean, there are certainly many fair use cases where you know, the individual creator has uh, prevailed over a defense of fair use. Um, uh, you know, is there anything about the fair use doctrine that corrects for the general imbalance of power in society between the haves and the haves nots? No. Um, uh, but nor is it particularly worse than any other aspect of society. Um, so, you know, I think. In the US, certainly an individual creator whose rights have been infringed, if they can get to court, then they can get to court under any kind of system, and that would be the same here. I think some people are worried that fair use would be a pretext for piracy. You know, those cases are easily dealt with. Um, uh, you know, if you're asked, you know, I guess other than saying it won't be any different to the rest of the legal system, there's not much more to be said. Other questions? Well, while, while you're all, oh no, we had a hand, Graham. Wait for the microphone, Graham. Thanks. Uh, Matthew, uh, uh, separately from questions of challenges to particular uh, uh, arguments about particular instances of possible fair use, uh, has there been anything at all convincing, do you think, or even interesting about arguments that fair use might, if introduced by a new country, 
might not be compatible with burn? Um, so this, this is an issue that is often raised. Uh, there are many people who are more expert in the burn convention than I am. Um, but uh, the basic answer is that's kind of a smokescreen. Um, uh, when the US joined Bern, no one suggested that fair use was a problem. When the US put the same three-step test into the WTO, into all you know, NAFTA, into its free trade agreements with uh, Singapore, Korea, Australia, um, and a whole bunch of other countries, uh, it, just, it doesn't make a lot of sense that fair use could be incompatible with the Bern three-step test uh, if the US keeps insisting on it and, you know, and keeps reiterating it. Um, and also, you know, when you look at the three-step test, the three-step test is an open standard. You know, the three-step test uh, talks about situations that don't conflict with the normal exploitation of the work and don't unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the copyright owner. Now, in a printing press paradigm, those cases are really rare. It's quite unusual that you would take Harry Potter and republish it, and that that would be something that wouldn't interfere with J.K. Rowling's normal exploitation, or you know, wouldn't prejudice her legitimate interests. Um, uh, so Byrne talks about certain special cases. And back when Byrne was written, those cases were not that common. Um, but you know, now we have a lot of technological uses uh, that are obviously harmless to the copyright interests of copyright owners. Um, you know, the search engines uh, is one example. Plagiarism software. Plagiarism software compares two documents and says one was or was not you know, likely copied from the other. You know, that's just a fact about the work. It's not conveying any of the work's substance. It doesn't relate to the author's copyright interests. Um, you know, I think they're all special cases under Byrne. Uh, you know, legally, I'm quite confident. And politically, I'm pretty sure that the US can't challenge it. Um, <laughs> and that no one really wants to uh, take on the US and the WTO. So uh, it's a smokescreen. And I, w I would assume, if I could just have a follow-up, I would assume that the US courts in the decisions you've looked at would never themselves raise the question. Well, the Berne Convention does not have direct effect in no, the no. US. Um, you know, and that's important to understand. Like, mm. The Berne Convention is not part of your law. It's an agreement that your government made about its law. Um, you know, and that's where it should be. Right? Well, Australia actually threw in some burn language into one of its statutory provisions, which is a huge mistake, you know, uh, because it just, it's very confusing. And you know, what's a special, special case? I'm not sure. Um, it doubles up. Uh, but no, US judges, US judges, quite frankly, you know, most of them could care less what the Burn Convention says. Do we have any other questions? If I might just ask one quickly, which is, I mean, one of the things that seems to emerge from your paper, and you talk about this a little in the paper, is that the, the factors that are listed in the legislation don't necessarily match what's actually important. Um, and that the language of Section 107 isn't necessarily a good match to the kinds of things that courts do talk about in the US. Now, from the perspective of a country that might be considering drafting a flexible exception, do you think we should try to do better? Or is the language of Section 107 a good sort of general guide? I think the structure of Section 107 is a good guide, but the language is a product of the technology of the time. And it's a product of the kind of experiences that were on people's minds. So, you know, multiple copies for classroom use gets a big parenthetical right in the middle of the statute. Um, that's not necessarily the way you would want to deal with that now. Um, but the, you know, the, the fundamental issues of, yeah, you should think about the nature and purpose of the use and whether there was any market impact. I mean, those seem like pretty solid universal factors. You can express them a lot of different ways. There's nothing magic about the US text. 
The case law really concentrates a lot on transformative use, uh, which is not in the statute at all. Um, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to do it. The ultimate question is, are you going to have a standard that is responsive to new developments and ultimately raises the issues of fundamental principle? One advantage of adhering at least a little bit closely to the US fair use doctrine is that the way the factors are set out now is the way courts structure their decisions. Um, so it's a framework for understanding and raising the issues. Um, and that would make you know, cross-pollination of case law uh, much more straightforward. But that's not to suggest that fairness in Australia is the same as fairness in America. I think that you know, fairness is, you know, it's a unique cultural construct. And as Australians, we may have slightly different views. We may not put as hard a thumb on the scale of free expression. Australia is very committed to free expression, but we don't take an absolutist view that they do in the US, for example. Um, but uh, you know, the short answer is we can do better than Section 107, but we shouldn't just make it difference for the sake of difference. Thank you. Um, I have one more question at the back, am I allowed? OK, one more question from the back. Tim. Hi, Matthew, this is a bit of a political question. I'm uh, interested in the reaction of the, pla the players and different folks to your punchline around you know, the myths that you've debunked. What are people saying in response to your point? Uh, well, Google quite liked it, <laughs> <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, uh, you know, I've not seen a lot of political reaction to it. Uh, I think that in the US, you know, the f whether fair use is predictable or not is a topic of academic discussion. You know, US cases are decided under the fair use doctrine. Um, uh, so you know, the issue of commercial, non-commercial is something that the US courts are grappling with. Um, but partly because the distinction has become so blurred. Um, you know, uh, but sort of moving away from your question, I want to actually sort of just leave off in a different direction. Imagine back in 1976 when they rewrote the US Copyright Act, they said, oh, no, let's, let's, just, let's just give rules. Let's just say what it is. One of the rules that you may well have gotten was that private use is not copyright infringement. Copyright is about these one-to-many relationships. You know, it's about big commercial actors um, and well then you would have destroyed the music industry with file sharing. Um, you know, the, whether through wisdom or good luck or uh, cowardice, you know, Congress didn't really specify too much detail in the fair use doctrine. Uh, you know, and it knew that issues like the video cassette recorder were on the horizon and it kind of ducked them. Um, and that's partly because even though you can get a lot of information through consultation processes, you only get a certain type of information. Um, so in the, you, what you don't get is you don't get the real information. So when US courts actually had to look at the VCR, they really studied whether it was having any effect. And they found that there was none. And that was key to them finding that it was fair use. And that was probably a better basis for the decision than saying, well, all private use is or is not subject to copyright law. Um, you know, if they tried to make that call in 1976, they would have got it vastly wrong in one direction or the other. And they would not have understood that, you know, they would not have been able to map out the more nuanced response that they needed. Um, so, you know, my view is that fair use is really not so unpredictable uh, and, you know, would be a good template for Australia. Um, so I'll leave it up. I'd ask you to join me in thanking myself for the presentation.